Welcome to the first screen casing of Strategic Command World War One Breakthrough. Strategic Command is a series of grand strategy games based around World War One and World War Two. Breakthrough is an expansion to the World War One version of the game. I have played countless hours of this game, both World War One and World War Two, and as such I will have my inherent bias toward liking the game. That's why it's not so much a review as it is simply a showing of the game, explaining of the game, and pointing out a few of the negative and positive things in this game. Starting with the negative, I will say the settings are more than just simplistic, the settings are almost non-existing. You have normal resolution, you have full screen on and off, you have sound on and off and music on and off, but there's no sound sliders, no music sliders, there's no music in the whole game other than the main menu where such music is pointless, and even the sounds are such generic sounds that you might as well turn them off. This game does not have very much of any of that. It's really, it, imagine playing it like a really good board game. A board game does not have sound, nor does it have music, unless it's a really weird one. The game, however, does have a very long campaign that will take you 30 to 40 hours, I would assume, to beat. I've never counted the time, but each turn takes 15 to 30 minutes, and there is a good 100 to 120 turns in a campaign unless you finish a campaign very quickly, but normally you can't. The main campaign goes from 1914 to 1918, which is the dates of the war in real life, but it will continue after 1918 if the war hasn't ended yet. Most times it will end around that time. It will end around the historic time. There is also a bunch of other scenarios, some of which are bigger, some of which are smaller. The brighter ones are the bigger campaigns, the less bright ones are the smaller campaigns. Most many of these are here because of the expansion set, but overall, even without the expansion, you can still play the main campaign and not much has changed. So you don't actually need the expansion unless you want to get that. It only adds a few minor rule changes, nothing that I will actually bring up in this video. You then have the shoe side screen, where you will either choose to fight for the central powers or the intent. In this game, unlike games like Hearts of Iron or many other games you would play, you don't actually play as a nation, you play as a whole alliance. You play either as the Germans, Austrian Hungarians and Ottomans, or you play as the British, French, Italy, Russians and USA. This is why many of the turns take a long time as you are literally doing everything for every nation. But it also means that you don't have to rely on stupid AI allies and generally it gives you a bigger scale of actually being able to plan out a historical plans, which is a good, because it, it, it gives you a wide array of options. You then have options for the different graphic styles for the units, I would keep this with the units unless you are very hyped for going for the historical kind of art style that they use in military stuff. You then, or most of these, you have a bunch of options, but most of them I would just keep all of them on as they are useful. Last turn summary, messages, national colors, fog of war. Generally, I, I have never played this game without fog of war, it seems weird, but I'm pretty sure it's mostly for debugging. The only thing I would turn off is quick logic and undo moves if you really know what you're doing, but I would keep undo moves as long as you're not playing in multiplayer. It is very abusable, but unless you really want to abuse under moves so there's not really a problem with that you can change the type that borders at one there's a few graphic things you can change but nothing too important you would mostly go to okay you can also go in advanced and turn on all of these the way that I've turned it on you don't need to but it's some of these are important useful highlights it, it shows you how far an airplane will be able to intercept on the board and that kind of stuff and then press ok and then it goes into the loading screen from where it will then go into the game itself. The whole game is on one board and there is no loading screens in the game besides unless of course you leave the game and load it later. As such, really, you don't have that many loading screens at all. It will then give you some basic strategic advice on for the campaign, but the game will not explain how to play the game, that's why I made this video. Besides reading the manuals, there's really no way to learn this game. That or just doing it by try and error, which is mostly what I did. Um, but the game will tell you the more specifics for the campaign itself, which is nice. So it, you don't need to really have historical knowledge. Uh, well, any historical knowledge you will need, the game will mostly tell you about. 
there might be some basic stuff that you need to know like people kill each other but I'm pretty sure everyone knows that this is the main map of the game where most of the time will be spent you can select units move units attack enemy units do all kinds of stuff with your units pretty much each unit has its own set of stats based on its strength which is its HP its supply which is the starting the amount of resources it, resources it has available to it the action points which is how far it can move the strikes is how many times it can attack in a turn readiness and morale are both used to calculate damage and the ground cover is how well it is entrenched in the area it's standing a higher ground cover counts as an extra defense stat which if you right click on a unit you have an array of options Reinforcement is to repair a unit, elite reinforcements is to stock it over 100%, upgrade is to upgrade its bams, operate is to move it by train to anywhere else in your territory, transport is to put it on a transport ship, and previous transport is to put it on a landing ship, the difference being transport ships only work in ports, allied ports, and amphibious ships work only um that you can land anywhere with them. Disband is to get rid of it and you get some of the money back. You probably will never ever use that, but whatever. You can rename a unit if you really want to do. You can look at the properties, which is where I'm going next. Each unit has a soft attack, a soft defense, a tank attack, and a tank defense stat. Soft attack is used to attack other infantry units. Soft defense is used for calculations in defending against infantry units. Tank attack and tank defense does the same, but for tanks. Tanks are very rare in World War One and will not actually show up in the first two years. So tank attack and tank defense tends to be really low, but it's not that important for you. Air attack um, is how good they are at attacking airplanes. Bomber attack being the same airplanes, but bombing airplanes. Air defense is how well they, how good they are against defending against those targets. Most of these. Uh, go to like those numbers are not that important really only soft attack soft defense is important this will tell you how far it can see an enemy unit which is two fields currently there's actually a unit in here but I cannot see it because two fields would be this and that so I have no idea it's here if I moved over here I would get ambushed like this it's enemy contact and then the enemy normally it would ambush me but because it's weaker than me it can actually not ambush me and that so that was not the best example but I know that there are units over here if I moved over there I would get ambushed which is normally really bad as you take about twice as much damage as you normally would horse units however can see up to three fields so if I use this move this horse unit over here I can see well, okay it gets ambushed because it's an enemy horse unit but now I can see all the way over here. I can see that there's an airplane over there. I can see pretty much anything in this area. So I know that there's no nothing else in these towns. Or at least close to these towns. HQs, unlike normal units, cannot attack. It, they will only g they give you troops supply and they also make your troops fight better. Normally every troop unit should be tied to an HQ, which will show the green circle around it. Each HQ can support 5 units, currently these are 5 units, so if I had another unit close to here it would fight really bad because it would not have an HQ assigned to it. This HQ is one of the worst HQs by the way, but whatever. The rating of the HQ is pretty much, it shows how good the HQ is in quality. This is, as I mentioned, a really bad HQ. You cannot increase the rating of an HQ directly. The only way to increase the rating of an HQ is by replacing the commander and then putting in like a new one in for example I could put that one in and but it will cost money which I do not currently have supply is based on both HQs and the um, territories around you each city or town will give off supply a town that, that is what the number here is a town will give off 5 supply a city gives off 10 supply there are some specific cases where it will not for example if I walked over here and captured this city it will now give only zero supply because it used to be an enemy and the supply will go up by one every turn till it reaches eight by ten why not ten but eight um 
If it's an enemy occupied city, it will only go up as high as 8, it will not go as high as 10. So you have to keep that in mind. In enemy territory, you don't get as much supply as you get in your own home territories because of partisans and just generally it's not as efficient. HQs, however, can turn supply up. It, it, it won't supply up in a way. So if you have if an HQ gets V supply, it will give all. It will create eight supply out of that. If an HQ gets six supply, it will create ten supply. Generally, the numbers are six and up. It gives out ten supply as it currently does. Five and lower, it gives out eight supply. If it gets zero supply, then it still gives off five supply on its own. But HQs will not um, bump each other up, so you cannot make a line of HQs and just keep the supply going like that. HQs need to take supply from towns or villages. As such, it is normally good to have an HQ close to the front line, but due to the fact that it cannot fight, as mentioned earlier, you don't want it at the front line. You don't want HQ to take damage. If it takes damage, it starts giving off less supply, and the rating of the HQ, it, the rating itself will not go down, but the boon it gives to all of your units will end up going down. So your units will start fighting considerably worse if your HQ is damaged. There is also the fact to consider that you cannot attack over rivers very efficiently, which you can see the numbers down here that will pop up when I go hover over it. That tells you how much you're going to lose, how much the enemy is going to lose, and why. Currently I would lose 3 HP points. My enemy would lose only 1 HP point. The reason is that I have an attack stat of 5. My enemy has a defense stat of 4 plus 1 because he has a ground cover of 1. And I have a negative 35% due to my river. Well, to, due to the river in a way. As such, it's not an efficient attack. You can get around that by reducing the ground cover. The ground cover will go down by 1 for each corpse that attacks the enemy. So if I had, had actually attacked, then he would have a ground cover of 0 now. That ground cover will increase by one every turn. So you, unless, unless you manage to destroy the enemy unit, just attacking to be decrease ground cover tends to be inefficient. The other thing you can do is use heavy artillery, which will also decrease the ground cover. For example, if I shot at this unit, it would play the animation, and then the ground cover is now zero out of one. It would now be more efficient to attack him. Still not, still not very efficient, because he's sitting in a forest, which gives him. I believe it gi that gives him a boon. Obviously I should probably know this, but I'm gonna go check out. You can right click on the unit. If I stopped right clicking too damn many times. There we go. You can And then you can see forest. It gives the defense for one point. So generally he's in a pretty good position in that forest because he has the forest and the river. Like, he, this is not a unit I can attack efficiently at all. That is why the Germans in real life, and as I'm going to do now, declared war on Belgium, for which you click on the maps up here, which is square field thingy, and then you click war maps, this shows you all the nations in Europe. All the nations you are at war with have their tank sign, all the nations you are not at war with have their respective flag, the flag of Belgium being this one. I want war with Belgium, so I click on declare war after clicking on the ma on the flag. Then it loads because there's a number of trigger triggers associated to declaring war on Belgium. Most of which being that England now also joined the war. Now I'm at war with Belgium and at war with England. But now that I'm at war with Belgium I'm allowed to walk through this territory. Which is extremely useful for getting around the entrenched French. As such I'm gonna move past him through Belgium and then down across. Obviously the Belgium people also have troops which I now have to destroy because they are now my opponent. I could attack him directly. You can see the tank sign which means that I get in 30% extra because I'm adjacent to his unit at the start of my turn which is considered a charge boon. But I will lose 35% because of the fact that I'm attacking over a river. So it would still be more efficient to move here and then attack rather than to attack and move. Keep also in mind that he is using a detachment which only has a stat of 1. That's why I would be fighting that efficient. Detachments are not very good at fighting but they are good at keeping areas occupied. And in some, er in some cases they are good enough at keeping the enemy away. So now that I have attacked him he has no ground cover. 
either so I can more easily destroy him. Once a unit reaches the HP it is destroyed and has to be rebuilt completely which takes a number of months so it's normally best to not let your units die. Now that it's dead I can also move through it so as you can see you can move and attack or you can attack and move but you cannot attack you cannot move and then attack what you cannot move attack and move you have to you only have two more actions every time you move you have a turn so you do this with all of your units trying to gain as much territory as quickly while not taking too many losses you will probably not actually reach your goal which would be Paris because they never reached Paris in real life but you will probably get around over here this area the main goal being to take this mine if possible take your means because there's this river which will otherwise be difficult to overcome you could also obviously attack Redun and try to push through the front there's a number of strategies you could apply which one is the best is always debated Antwerp is a castle much like here is a castle or well, a fortress these will be very difficult to destroy even though this unit isn't really bad it's currently has zero supply because it just joined the war and has not much readiness I even then I only fight zero two doing two damage and taking zero because he has an entrenchment of five normally you need a uh, gun to take down that which is why I placed my heavy artillery gun over here which will then attack Verdun and take Verdun hopefully that is uh, not that commonly used plan but it's one of my starting strategies that I tend to like if you mo move all of your units then you will end your turn after having moved everything I will obviously not move all of these because that would take too long and that's what I mentioned earlier this game takes quite a long time to play but it is a lot of fun most of all once you start having done five or ten turns it, it becomes a bit unique every time you play it the base setup is obviously always the same but some things work out better some things work out less well and there's a lot of having to adapt to events as they happen the other thing that you can do is have your units entrench rather than move. If you entrench your unit, you can decide where it will entrench to and the number of sides being up to two sides. The reason why you would only use one side is normally to that in case the enemy takes a trench, he cannot use the trench against you as efficiently. Almost 100% of the time, if not even 100% of the time, I will use a two-sided entrenchment though, because the case of it being used against you unless you place it badly is not that common. An entrenchment will increase the... Having a unit entrenched obviously makes it more difficult for your enemy to attack him. What was ground cover now turns into entrenchment. It still is the out of one, but as your technology increases, this entrenchment will get better. But it will also give you a boon, much like your river. I believe it's a 20% defense boon against any attacks that come from the direction you are entrenched to. You can go to properties and then trench, which will show you where the entrenchment is pointing. The, so uh, having a river and entrenchment like from this direction, would it would become very difficult to attack the enemy over that area. That is obviously what the French will start doing over here, so it will become very difficult to get through there at all. That is once more why we move past them, hopefully trying to take as much territory and taking them off guard as much as we can. The next thing is which I just did is force march. Your units can move twice the distance they would normally move if you tell them to force march. Force marching will however destroy the readiness and morale of your troop which means it, the unit doesn't take any VA damage and it doesn't cost you anything but if your unit gets attacked or fights in the coming turns, it will not fight very efficiently. Force March is however still useful for taking more territories than your enemy expected. You can also only Forge March in, in allied territory, in territories that you own. So you have to have one unit take the territory and then the next unit move to it. You cannot Forge March into towns, for example, that the enemy owns. So you have to Force March around them, which I'm do currently doing. The other problem with Forge March is that you move very far, but your HQs cannot forge, Force March. HQs will end up being left behind, which means that the units at the front will become very vulnerable to counter attacks. So it's a, uh, you have to very, it's a balancing act. 
supply, as mentioned earlier, will inc decrease by one field for each field it travels. Currently this will give out 10 supply. It will then move over here for 9 and then 8. It will move by roads because that's where it's most efficient. So 9 and 8 and 7 and 6 and 5. So the, the, by the time it reaches this unit, it will only be for supply, which means this unit is will not be in a good fighting condition at all next turn. It will only be able to move around by three movement points and take maybe the city, but it will not do much besides that. Horse units obviously get a lot out of force march because they have five movement points, so they will move all the way to ten. Horse units are normally used for cutting off the enemy or generally moving into, sometimes you can use them if you get them behind enemy lines to ca cause havoc. Now that I've moved all the way over here, next turn they could hopefully take this port which would be efficient because if I take this port then I have a port. Why would you not want a port? I don't know, that didn't really go anywhere. The important thing to consider is that you do need an HQ that needs to be assigned to these units. Currently this horse unit does not actually have an HQ. It, the HQ assigned to this unit is not close enough. An HQ only has five fields of distance it can uh, attach to. So these units will generally be... The point being, these un units will not fight very well next turn. At all. The next thing is that you also play all the other nations in the war. You don't just play Germany. I also have the Austrian Hungarians which the Austrian Hungarians plan to invade Serbia while they now have to defend against Russia that so I'm and the Austrian Hungarians do not have nearly as many troops and you are not trying to attack Russia it would be inefficient what you try to do is defend these castles because losing these castles will make Romania more likely to invade you you need Romania because you're getting your food out of Romania Bulgaria, however, will enjoy it if you destroy Serbia and will join the war as they want part of the Serbian territories. So you have to balance out not losing territory to the Russians while taking territory from the Serbians. The important part here is mostly just to keep these castles alive. The oil field will almost always be lost, but against AI it's actually possible to keep it. Against most human players, it's kind of a gambling act. You try not to lose units because the uh, the, uh, the Austrian Hungarians do not have very many units. They also don't have a strong economy as such they will not be able to build new units as they lose them very quickly. You also have fleets where, which means that you have to keep your fleets mostly intact. The allies have a better fleet than you as such you are trying to avoid any kind of fleet combat early game. For Germany this is not a problem as they have as they were very smart and built this channel to Denmark, or by the southern half of Denmark. This channel lets you f go through it. The enemies cannot go through it. As such, if the German fleet is ever in danger, all it has to do is then go on the other side, and the English cannot attack you, unless the Eng English get Denmark. But the English would not never invade Denmark, so the German fleet is safe. The Austrian Hungarians do not have that lifestyle of easiness. I don't even know what I'm saying. The German, the, the Austrian Hungarians do not have that. As such, keeping the fleet alive mostly consists out of staying in your ports and avoiding conflict. You could invest your economy points into building the fleet up, but then you do not have as much money to invest it in troops. Money in this game is counted in MPP, also known as military production points. Military production points are created every turn by the territories that you own. Towns create no military production points. Cities create one military production point for each supply it creates. Mines create three for each supply and make capitals create two for each supply. Oil fields will also end up creating military production points which at the rate of two per one supply. So generally taking cities, mines and capitals or oil fields is important for the long term of the war while small towns really affect more so the national morale. The national morale is important as it keeps your people in the nation happy. It's uh, If your national morale starts going down too low, people will end up starting to strike or will even try to overthrow the government. 
and if it reaches zero you pretty much lose the war as such you need to keep your people happy by taking territories every turn a territory will, will change national morale so if I owned this town I would drain 12 national morale from my enemy Russia and give Germany 12 national morale which is another reason it's another incentive for the Germans to invade France Small and minor t um, nations do not have national morale, such as Belgium, and their territories do not give national morale. As such, invading Serbia for the Austrian Hungarians will not actually make the Austrian Hungarians happier, but obviously, it's still more efficient as fighting the Serbians for over a long period of time will also make them not as happy. For each damage done to your units in wars and military production points, you'd lose the national morale. So if a unit is, if every t one tenth of a unit is worth twelve military production points, then you will lose twelve national morale points for each damage it takes. As such, the five damage that I just took there probably drained a good fifty national morale points. Germany starts with forty-five thousand national morale points. Each nation starts with different based on just generally their will to fight war. Germany having the second highest after the UK and the USA, but the USA joined so late in the war that it will almost never, I, I, the USA will never leave the war by national morale. You never take the USA and the USA is never really defeated. And they are not, you do not need to defeat the USA to win the game as the Germans. All you have to do is defeat Russia and France. You could technically also defeat England and Russia or France and England, but either of the two will win the game, but England is pretty much impossible to defeat as they have a lot of national morale. Italy does not, it's actually not important to win the game but Italy has a low national morale as such they will be defeated pretty quickly and it's it, there is a strategy to defeat them because it will make the enemy weaker. Besides that you can purchase units with the military production points. Units are cheaper to purchase if they died in combat once without being cut off. If they are in low supply aka five supply or less when they die you have to pay the full price otherwise you pay half price as such sometimes it's better to lose a unit and then we buy it but it will take multiple months as such you have to calculate in that risk every unit every nation buys for itself and there's a few units that you cannot buy earlier in the game we already showed the war map then then there is the war map that I showed yes and then there's a the convoy map this will show you all the convoy lines, which can be relevant, but you cannot do. You can attack the convoys with submarines, but most of them, the information is minor. As it will not tell you how much money it actually makes, but it will show you who is important to keep allied. As such, Sweden and Norway are important for the Germans, as they actually do give you money every turn. They give you MPP. Greece has a trade line with the Egypt. I mean with Egypt but then the trade line is with the UK because the UK owned Egypt. So it's important technically for the Germans to take Greece if they ever get that far. Besides that you have the research screen which will also use military production points. As such you have to keep a balance between using military production points for your troops to buy more troops or restock your troops and between research and diplomacy. Diplomacy is very money inefficient and should almost never be used. It, it, you tend to invest a lot more money than you actually get out of it. It's better to invest it in research, but sometimes there are specific cases where diplomacy will be important for such a case being Holland. Holland is very important for the Germans as most of the trade will go through Holland. If, the, if Holland becomes more aligned to the intento rather than to the Germans, Germany will pretty quickly start falling apart, as such losing them will mostly lose you the game. That is where diplomacy comes in a lot. Sometimes it also matters for small nations such as Sweden or Switzerland. Every nation has an alignment rating, Sweden having 20% toward the central powers, if you see in the top right of the screen. Norway has 0% toward the central powers. If Norway went any distance toward the intent, they would stop trading with me. And then at that point I would stop losing the money income from that. As such, there can be importance there, but it's only important if your enemy invests in diplomacy. So both sides and both sides most of the time do not invest in diplomacy at all. 
research is very important and early game the most important thing is trying to take trying to do losses to the enemy but also trying to keep your nation you know to keep your national losses as uh, at such a minimum that you don't actually need to invest money in restocking them because you much rather want to invest money into the research the war will never end in 1914 and as such a long-term investment is a lot more efficient than a short-term investment the most important research topics are infantry warfare industrial technology production technology trench warfare intelligence and heavy artillery at least that is by my opinion. Infantry warfare makes your infantry soldiers better. After you do get the level up, you have to manually upgrade each of your units, which will also take military production points, but they will fight about one-fifth better for each level of infantry warfare as such. In the long term, it will drain your enemy a lot of money if they don't have that research. Industrial technology simply increases your military production points per turn, which is always important. It's based on the more tighter you have, the more it increases the military production points. Production technology will speed up the production of units, so instead of maybe four months, it will only take three months to build a corpse, and it will make oil purchases cheaper. So in a way, it has the same effects as industrial technology, but it has a boon of also making production faster, but it has a drawback of not allowing you to invest those points in research, technically. Like if you have no units to buy, then the production technology is useless. It's only useful as long as you actually have something to invest it in. Intelligence increases the speed of technology gained for your nation, and it decreases the speed of technology gained for all enemy nations, which stacks with each of these. So you need at least a bit of intelligence, but it, it, it like getting one level into intelligence is normally pretty good, and then maybe late game a second. But stacking all intelligence has no direct gain, it only increases the research speed. So investing all your points into intelligence is useless. Gas shell production um, makes the heavy artillery guns gain an extra shell every turn. They start with one shell a turn, which is not enough to actually defeat heavy entrenchment over long ter over long time. Because this place has an entrenchment of five. I need to five Go shots to actually get it down to the entrenchment. If I do not defeat it in that turn, it will next turn have an entrenchment of three because it goes to half rounded up. As such, I would only get one good attack in, and then the next turn I would be screwed. So it, it's important, but only later in the game when you actually have enough heavy guns because early game only Germany has one heavy gun unit and no one else has any heavy guns. Trench warfare increases efficiency of trenches. As I mentioned earlier, you can entrench your units. They then have an entrenchment rating of 3 out of 1, next turn they would have an entrenchment rating of 1 out of 1, because every turn it goes up by 1, which is the same as ground cover, but it has a boon of a trench, but for each level of entrenchment, military tech, it will also go up by 1, so if you have level 1 entrenchment, then you will have 2 out of 2 later in the game, or later you will even have 5 out of 5, or 4 out of 4, so at some point, attacking a unit that has, even attacking a unit that has 2 entrenchment, with a normal corpse will be extremely inefficient because each of these points is an extra defense value. So the unit has a defense of 4, if it had an entrenchment of 2 it would have a defense of 6, which means your enemy would be fighting extremely inefficiently. As such that one is important, most of all for the intended to get, the French needed and the English needed. The Russians are more offensive and the Germans are also more offensive. But it generally is a technology everyone needs, because get, not getting it at all will make you very vulnerable to counter-attacks. There's naval warfare, which is actually used as technology in the sense that every single nation in the game has it. But it, um, it, it makes the ships better. I, I think it's only there because there are some ships which are considered better ships, and then there are dreadnoughts. Dreadnoughts are pretty much World War One era better ships, and then the other one, the normal better ships, these are just ships that were built in the late 1800s rather than in the early 1900s. As such, they are not as good in quality. There's a huge difference between the two. It might, like, it only says that one there, but that one means a lot. A normal ship has a rating of 444. A beloved up ship has a 777, so it's almost twice as powerful. Ships are extremely expensive in this game, I believe. I mentioned that already. So even up, uh, even leveling up a normal ship to the 777 will cost you a good 100 to 200 production points. 
Eclipse being 200 production points ish. So, you can get a whole corps of people pretty much for a level up of a ship. Building a new battleship from ground up is extremely expensive actually, as such, you don't normally want to lose your battleships. Building a leveled up battleship will cost you a good 600 points, which Germany makes a good 300 to 400 points a turn, so you normally don't have that much money left over. You then have the graphs, which are important to keep you updated with pretty much how you're doing and how everything is doing. It will show you how many troops each nation has in land, air, naval. It will also show you general of all the troops combined, so it kind of shows you the balance of the war. Important is it normally to stick to 50-50. The Germans start, this is Germans, Austrian, Hungarians, Ottomans, Russia, Italy, France, England. The Germans start weaker than the other. But the German troops are better. Normally, about halfway through the game, you do want at least to be at that 50-50. Because if you keep being behind the enemy, at some point you, they, your nation will kind of start falling apart. It, it, that is mostly the thing that you need to keep an eye on to see how well you are doing. Besides that, this shows you how much territory a nation has. These are the cities which actually produce money. Those are ports which don't produce money, but ports are generally useful. And those are mines, which, as I mentioned, produce three times as much money as a city. So every mine is pretty much worth three times as much as a city. And then you can also check your losses. Currently, I only killed one unit, so that's the only unit that died. You can also check graphs for more in-depth information on the amount of military production points you have lost, you have made, and you have spent on units. The uh, way that national morale went over the course of the game. All of these are obviously currently very devoid as not much has actually happened. This activates a grid which you can play on which is very useful if you haven't played the game much yet as it will make it more easy to see where you can move or sometimes it's just generally useful for checking stuff before actually doing a move. But I tend to turn it off as I do find it to be a bit obstructive. You can sh then hide and show units which if you want to see the supply of something, you can do that. So technically, I just click on the place and then it tells you how much supply there is. You can then go through the units like this, which I have never actually used as there are too many units. And normally, what I use to find out if I've moved all my units is I look at the map and the map, the blinking units are not moved units. As such, I go to one front, then I do the next front, and then I do like all of them. And then at the end of it, I can look at the map and see if I missed any specific places. Currently, I haven't actually moved my fleet. The Germans start with two submarines. Normally, they want to move this submarine over north and then to the east because they want to start attacking the trade lines unless they have some kind of specific plan that where they would not want to do that. The other submarine starts in here. The important thing is the Germans do the first turn as such. That submarine can always move up north without any danger because you know for a fact that the, enemy, that the British do not have a fleet there as the British fleet starts mostly over here and mostly over here. You do not want to move the German fleet anywhere close to the channel early game as the British fleet is a lot more powerful. The British will end up having to split their fleet to send in half of it or at least to send some of it into this ocean because they are not strong enough over here to defeat the Austrian Hungarians yet, the Austrian Hungarian fleet. So the British have to play in balancing act between keeping their fleet over here on keeping the fleet in here. You don't if for the Germans and Austrian Hungarians it's important not to lose either of the fleets because otherwise the Germans don't have to um otherwise the British don't have to play that balancing act anymore. Besides that there's a manual button and then there's options which I have shown earlier. These are the same options. You can always check your victory conditions which are pretty simplistic. And that is the basis of the game. The other thing to keep in mind really is just Supply is affected by one more thing that I had not brought up. Supply, I mentioned that the supply city will have 10 and it starts with 0 if you take it and then it goes up by 1 every turn. But important is also railway connections. A city, a place cannot go up beyond 5 supply if it is not connected by railway to your capital or an industrial center. I don't know if this game actually counts in, yeah okay, here's an industrial center. This one does not actually have a railway, but it will stay at 10 because it's an industrial center. This will also stay at 10 because it's an industrial center. But for example, this city, if uh, if 
the British landed and cut it off by taking this part. Well, okay, they don't need this. But if they landed and cut it off by taking this field where I moved my unit now, then they would. This city would be cut off. It would drop to five supply, including the port. As such, it is important to keep your railways connected. For the British, for example, it'd be very important to take this or this place, as it will cut everything south of it off and make any offenses of offensives really difficult. This is also important for castles, as some castles, uh, most of our early game, are extremely difficult to capture. If you can, however, cut off the castle, it will start dropping really low supply, and the units inside it will start losing morale and readiness. And as we I've shown up here, it makes a huge difference if a unit it makes a huge difference if a unit has high morale or readiness. So that is mostly the basis of the whole game. The other thing you can do is you can use operate, which makes it, uh, lets you move a unit from one place in your territory to another place in your territory, as long as there is a railway connection and the place has five supply or higher. It costs money to do that. But uh, that can be useful most of all for the Germans early game if they want to move some of the troops east to the west because the Russians tend to invade you early game. National morale objectives are special cities which will, if losing them will have an impact on your national morale. Sometimes they will also have an impact on the opponent's national morale. For example, if the Russians lose Leningrad, okay, it's not Leningrad yet, it's Petrograd. If they lose Petrograd, then they lose national morale. Petrograd is also the capital in World War One, and the Germans will gain national morale. In real life, they never took Petrograd because uh, they didn't actually invade Russia very far. But it's important to keep that in mind. Same with Paris. If the Germans take Paris, the Germans celebrate the taking of Paris. If the French take Strasbourg or Metz, then they celebrate uh, celebrate the capture of those places. It's sometimes a bit wonky, as I do not like. The Germans don't at all celebrate the capturing of Verdun or Belfort, so it tends to be it tends to be based on the historical events. But sometimes it's questionable if it would have been the same in a different situation. Like if the French had taken this city early in the war, then maybe they wouldn't have cared. But historically, they took it very late in the war, and at that point, it affected them more. Besides that, I might actually be wrong. They might have never taken it. I don't know. <laughs> um. Besides that to keep in mind, just really everything else will be explained by events. As I mentioned, the game is very good at explaining what you are supposed to do in this scenario. It just does not explain the base game outside of the manual. Which the manual is actually very well written and I've read it at least twice already. And I probably still got some things wrong. So if you do like reading manuals, I would read that even it has a lot of fun flavor text and all that kind of stuff. Overall, the whole game has a lot of fun flavor text, which is one of the main reasons why I like it. I'm actually going to end the turn just to show how ending a turn looks. Once I end the turn, now I get into this decision event. Admiral von Ingol, our middlemare division, whose flagship is the Goban Badekusa, is currently sailing in the Mediterranean towards Constantinople. It is recommended that the Goban continues on to Constantinople, where it will be taken into service with the Ottoman Navy and renamed the Yatsu Sultan Selmi and I cannot pronounce those names, no. Doing this will not only provide the Ottoman Navy with an urgently needed reinforcement, but it will also help to mobilize opinion of the Ottoman Empire toward joining the war on our side. If you decide not to send the Goban on to Constantinople, then she will instead sail to Pola in the Adriatic, where she will serve alongside the Austro-Hungarian Navy. Would you like the Goban to sail to Constantinople to serve as the Ottoman Navy? Yes. Or would you rather not sail uh, and would you advise that she said to Pola to serve alongside the Austrian Hungarians? Saying to keep in mind, as with most of these events, saying yes is better. Most of them are based on the historical actions, and at least for the Germans, many of the historical actions they took were generally smart. As sending the Goban to the Ottomans is a lot more efficient than sending them to the Austrian Hungarians. However, it is viable to send it to the Austrian Hungarians if you have a game plan. If you have a plan, for example, to take the oceans and you are really focused on defeating the British in the North Sea and in the Middle Sea, then sending it to go sending the Goban to the Austrians might be good as it might catch the enemy off guard. They will try to invade the they will try to destroy the Austrian Hungarian fleet and you have more ships than they anticipated. 
but generally you want to send it to the Ottomans as the Ottomans will be rather happy about that and uh, it's also a lot safer in the Ottoman Navy and then this guy, I'm not going to read all of them, but this guy has one where the Austrian Hungarians had planned to invade Serbia and they asked you if they want to deploy the troops against Serbia or if you want to deploy them against Russia it will take them a week or whatever, and normally in game it's about a turn, maybe two turns, I think one turn for them to deploy them against Russia it's good to deploy them against Russia technically as invading Serbia is rather inefficient but you can do it so it's really up to you in that case but the yes event is deploying them in Serbia the main problem is by, with deploying them against Russia is if you play a good opponent there is actually you can technically invade Austria Hungaria really fast and if you get lucky you can cut those units off before they ever deploy and then they will not deploy you do not get the units back if they can't spawn they will deploy if you take the territory back but if you never do then they are dead units which is very efficient it will then show you the mobilization events which will spawn more units which the main problem is the game does not tell you where those troops are going to mobilize as such it's a bit of a try and error you have to know beforehand in what towns troops are going to mobilize for example Hindenburg which was very important for the Germans will mobilize in East Prussia in a specific town having a unit in that town will not stop him from mobilizing but it will kind of screw over his starting location he will then spawn somewhere around it and you have a useless unit standing in the town so yeah those are really the only problems there's a few things that you need to know you just need to learn by having played the game at least once a number of events that you don't know would happen beforehand unless you are really well read up on the history of the war and then you see your opponent do stuff he pretty much does what you do obviously I played extremely terrible because I wasn't actually playing the game normally you would not play this way and as I said the AI is pretty decent at what it actually does it, ha it runs two problems it either is sometimes too passive and sometimes too aggressive Sometimes it will just send its troops into like a, into one of your entrenchments and just murder itself. And sometimes it decides to give up territory it would not actually need to give up. The Russians, for example, are playing very, very, very passive. Whether or not that is actually bad, I can't say right now, but I just expected them to do a bit more damage to my troops. But overall, the day I, for, I played a lot of grand strategy games and Normally the AI is always extremely lacking because they are very difficult to program. This game has one of the better AIs. The base game has a campaign where um, Italy joins the Germans and the Austrian Hungarians, which I'm just bringing up because that is one of the most fun a campaigns to play if you are very good at the game and have played against AI multiple times. Because it kind of, it, it doesn't make the AI, sh I mean it kind of cheats in the sense that it's a very gimped scenario against the intent but it's it doesn't cheat out right like it, it's still a fair game it's just a very powerful opponent that you're fighting and yeah for example there it's I don't know if it's really viable he's just throwing his troops at it being very insistent on trying to defeat that unit and then losing a lot more than it has to but well, mainly even for a human player I have that happen many times to myself because sometimes you don't you never know exactly what to expect you don't know what your enemy has because of the fog of war you have to be very cautious about what you do because there's, there's many ways that you can play this game and there's no one perfect way technically if you play the same opponent multiple times it's a good idea to keep switching up your strategy strategies because if you know your opponent's strategy you can counter it very efficiently even if it's a very powerful strategy AI does take a bit of time, but normally, if you're really into the game, it's not a problem as you do tend to see a lot of stuff happen. Um, and you kind of do want to see those things happen. Um, you could technically make it not show those, but you do want to keep an eye on everything. For and Celebrate, it's a taking of Mulhausen. Oh, there, yeah, that. Like I said, it's like I took towns, but Germans don't care. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I lost it because I wasn't playing at all. I didn't even move those troops. The British Expeditionary Force deploys in France. I love those pictures because those are like brilliant pictures. I just generally, I love a lot of the flavor text in those games. Flavor events, I guess, more than text. French fully see as Marines mobilized to defend the North Coast.
French mobilization continues. I don't even know why I'm saying it like that. But hey, they're French. Processing events. So once the event starts, that means that the opponent also ended his turn. Like, he's not gonna start moving troops anymore because the event's already started happening. Intended units blockade import to Germany. Fear as if the German raiders upset British trade. But yeah, if you do like the. Uh, most of all, if you like what if scenarios, this is a very good game once if you can get into it because you can do a lot of what if scenarios. I have done multiple things. I've tried to invade Switzerland before, I've tried to invade Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. I, there's a lot of. The game doesn't tie you down at all. You can do whatever you want, at least to a certain extent. This is the one about from Hindenburg, who is now going to spawn in this town. But if I had put a unit in that town, he would probably spawn over here or over there. It, if I put units all over there, I don't even know what would happen. That would be an interesting test. You could just like fill this place up with units and then go over the deployment. So now that's one turn, and then I get my another turn. Now I've actually made military production points, and now I can use them. For example, I can stock up my ship if I was focusing on the fleets. As you can see, stocking up a ship is very expensive. I mean, just the three points is a good 60 points worth. I could also upgrade a ship. You cannot do both in one turn. It's doing upgrades or doing a stock up takes a whole turn worth of movement points. If I upgrade a ship to the thing, now it took all of the points. I mean, now it can't move. That's what I'm saying. Another thing to keep in mind is you cannot upgrade a unit adjacent to an opponent, which works both ways. As long as my unit is adjacent to him, he cannot upgrade his unit with infantry research, if I, if there was infantry research at this time. So, sometimes it's very good to bind down your enemy by forcing it to, like, if I kept this unit over here, he would never be up, able to upgrade. I can then move this unit over here, if I had my upgrade, switch them out, upgrade my unit, and then have the enemy be lower level. Another thing you can do, which I didn't actually mention, is you can switch out with a shift key. So my unit can attack, do 2 damage, and take 2 damage, and then I can switch them out. This will move. This will take all but one movement point out of a unit, and this unit like, it can't attack a second time even if it was adjacent to an enemy. This also will drain your readiness and morale by I believe 20%, as such, if you cannot do it, it's more efficient than doing it. But uh, it is useful for fighting at front lines. Technically, he just kind of wasted his troop there by doing that. But I mean, he did get a event which ended up actually putting his morale above 100%. So that's pretty good. Morale events will also affect troops. All troops will get a. That's why he has a very high overall morale right now. His morale is actually higher than his readiness. Generally, because it will have a minor effect, not a big one, but it will affect the troops by a bit. I have no idea why I just went all the way into the ocean. These horse units can technically now go all the way to Le Havre, which was what I mentioned was originally my plan. So that ended up working pretty well, but they are in very low supply and they couldn't fight efficiently at all. To keep in mind, the, the British only start with one corpse that is actually usable, but it is the best corpse in the game. This has two and a half experience points out of three. I have no idea why it says out of 5, but units in this game can only get 3 experience points. The 5, you can't go above that. Experience is very rare and very powerful, as such Germans tend to be very powerful early game. As, because this unit, they, all German units start with 1 experience point. The Guard Corps starts with 1 extra reinforcements. I mentioned this early game that you can technically do this. You can only do this if you're not adjacent to an enemy and if, if it has an experience, one point for each experience, it will take all of the movement points, it will cost twice as much money as it normally would, and you can only do one per turn. Even if it had three experience points, you could only stock it up to 11, and then to 12, and then to 13. As such, I've almost never used it, but technically you can use it if you're trying to do a big push in a specific area, yeah, because front lines in this game are very important, and breaking a front line is very difficult. So... If you are trying to do a big push, you might ready your troops by doing that. Now to keep in mind is, I am actually going to try to go kill someone. 
I, I, I wanna use the heavy guns just to show entrenchment because now it has one entrenchment and now it has zero entrenchment. I believe I've shown this earlier, but I'm doing this in small parts, so whatever. The goal would also be here to take the capital, but if you take the capital, the capital will be moved to the alternate capital. If you take both, then they will surrender. Minor nations have a chance to continue fighting as long as they have troops within their own border. As such, pulling, but if they, they will continue fighting as long as they have troops within their own border, but if their troops are within their allied territory when their nation surrenders, the troops will do not despawn, they will continue fighting in exile. That is at least for most nations. That's for the Serbians, that's for the Bulgarian, Belgians, Bulgarians, not Bulgarians. These are the Bulgarians. Um, I'm pretty sure it's for Greece. It's not for Romanian. I, I don't know. Some of them do not have it. The game doesn't tell you which ones have it and which ones don't. But mostly it's for almost all nations. You normally should assume that the troops will continue fighting. As such, killing them is actually a good thing. You should not just walk around them because they will be a pain if they continue living. Most of all because that one actually starts with 11, which means that it's one of those re really few really powerful units that exist in this game. I believe I've brought this out, but you can sack and replace an HQ. For example, I could replace this one with this one. It will cost money, and it will take all of the movement points. You can only do that. So normally, you can, every unit has one action it can do. It can move and attack, or it can be resupplied, or it can entrench, or it can be exchanged for some other unit. You can't do multiple things with one unit in a turn unless it's attacking and moving because that's considered mostly one thing. This unit is really bad because it has zero supply because when I started this territory was actually cut off. You normally try to keep a line. I did this over here. If you keep them in a line like this, the supply will move to the field. It's more efficient if you go over the roads because if you don't go over the roads it will start losing a lot. A lot of supply. But so important is keeping lines and not getting cut off. For example, if the French had kicked this unit out like this and then had taken this place and this place and this place, all of these would be cut off and pretty much dead. In two turns, they would be useless and you could just wipe them. So it's very important to push, but at the same time to make sure that your defenses also stay intact. I believe that this is pretty much strategic command, the Great War. Well, well it's a name breakthrough, but the base game is called the Great War. I will link to the demo, and I will link to the expansion. I will link to the, all the stuff on the on their website. And if you enjoyed this, then give me a thumbs up, give me a comment, say that you enjoyed it, do whatever. And I'm considering if someone is actually interested in seeing a full game of this against AI. Then you could also post that, and I'm con I, I would consider doing something. I would probably do something unorthodox, like invading Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, because I still want to pull that off. I've tried it, but I've never succeeded at doing it. Invading Switzerland, I did, and I won that game, but in Switzerland... Let's just say they were smart in not invading Switzerland, because mountains are a pain to fight in, and you don't want to do that. Also, the USA does not enjoy you invading Switzerland. So yeah, thanks for watching and we'll see you guys next time. I don't know who is we, but I'm used to doing stuff with screaming. I will see you guys next time.